This is Annabelle Caberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my chance to talk with professionals in the creative industries to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. For this first podcast of Quifervi, I interview Richard Kirstein, who is the founding partner of a music procurement company, Resilient Music. I met Richard quite a few years ago now, probably four or three or four years ago, um, at our private members club for hospital club in London, um, at a do. And when I launched Quifervi, my law firm based out of London and Paris, focusing on advising the creative industries, I um, had the pleasure of collaborating with Richard on several projects, work projects. And I thought that he would be a great guest for my first podcast, so he goes. Would you say, Richard, that Resilient Music is a music supervising company? Or is, is, is there a particular a particularity to the music procurement um, status that you give to your, your company? Okay, well, I normally think of music supervision as perhaps more of the creative end of the business. So companies that find tracks for commercials or find tracks for films or TV. Uh, traditionally, that's that's how I think supervision is, is thought of. What Resilient does is purely um, rights clearance, rights brokering, um, which is a sort of procurement and business affairs task. So I would describe Resilient as a music rights procurement consultancy. I understand. So what you are saying is that you are not doing the curation on behalf of a brand the choice relating to the songs that they want to have in their different ads or, or video content, you are really focusing on the business side. Correct, yes. I mean, in a few cases, brands or agencies will ask us to help them find tracks or even find artists, and for those projects, I'll, I'll bring in people to help us do that. But for the most part, the clients know what they want creatively, and our job is to go and buy it. Ah, Okay. Does this happen often, that they know exactly what they want? Most of the time, yes. Okay. Because the clients that we work with, um, if they work with an agency, often the agency is the one suggesting the tracks. Um, okay. Sometimes clients have in-house um, resource to kind of suggest tracks as well. Um, but if for whatever reason those tracks can't be cleared, then often I will bring someone in to find some alternatives. Right. If the track that they want is either not clearable or too expensive. So, so when you say you bring someone in, would it be as a music supervisor? Or? Yes. So okay. I have, I have uh, okay. kind of external creative music strategist partners mm. who I will bring in on a project basis to kind of to work with. So if you are focusing mainly on the business side of things, um, I suppose that you must have some in-house legal capabilities at Resilient Music. Uh, to do the negotiation of a contract because it's a lot of business and legal, like commercial and legal negotiation that you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yes, I mean there's kind of two parts. There's the front-end negotiation of commercial terms and the back-end negotiation of the long-form licenses. Um, within my team I've got one US attorney who's perhaps to be based in the UK, uh, a couple of paralegals, one who's based here, one who's based in New York. Um, I then will do some of the front-end commercial negotiation depending on what the project is. Uh, it's very rare that I'll handle the negotiation of the long-form license just because the other members of my team are much better at it than I am. Uh, they're certainly far um, more knowledgeable about the law than I am, um, and, but that balance seems to work quite well. Oh, wonderful. So basically, are you saying that you focus your, your efforts on generating the business and getting the yeah, clients into more Yeah, if, if I'm doing my job properly, I should be focused on winning new business, yeah. managing the client relationships, um, overseeing the project work that my team does, um, but much more focused on um, working on the business rather than working in it. As right. any you know, business owner should be. That's a nice position to be in. Well, <laughs> it, like, it, you it, know, the, the other side view. It and, doesn't uh, always work out that we way. We need to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that yeah. to make it perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't always work that way. But the most important thing is is going out and generating new business because you know, without that, you don't have a business. Yes, I agree with you totally. So, just thought so that our listeners are really completely one hundred percent clear on what you do. Firstly, I, I wanted to 
point out the fact that you've written an extremely um, insightful book, Music Rights Without F uh, Fights, mm -hmm. which has got excellent reviews on Amazon, which I am currently uh, reading. And I find it fascinating, especially because you put a lot of uh, little stories and anecdotes so that makes the, 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 the whole thing even more vivid. I wanted to ask you whether it's possible for you to describe us a uh, one of the uh, sing deals that you did for uh, Hunter, where you were uh, actually, I understand, a broker that deal with possibly the management, um, publisher and uh, label of uh, the delightful Courtney Barnett uh, for her track. Nobody really cares if you don't go to the party. I discovered Courtney Barnett, uh, by the way, earlier this year for an artist who is um, uh, quite keen on uh, Courtney Barnett, Barnett's uh, work. And she, this, this artist I was speaking to dis described her as being the only female artist out there who works in the um, rock niche. Uh, there aren't many female rock acts, and uh, Courtney Barnett is definitely uh, uh, an excellent representation of that. So, um, so she came on my radar uh, earlier this year, and I'm delighted. I mean, I was delighted yesterday when I was browsing, browsing on your website, uh, resilientmusic.com, that uh, you did a deal with Courtney Barnett, Management, and Hunter. So, is that something you can talk about? Yeah, I, please. From I mean, it was a while ago. Um, from memory, it was a straight sync deal. So, I think we just did the deal directly with the publisher and the label. Um, okay. And I remember they were independents. So I can't remember which ones. Uh, she is an artist is Australian. She is Australian. Yeah. And I remember that it took a while to track down who her UK rights owners were. Really? What and she didn't know? Well, no, it's not that she didn't know. Is is because quite often with independent artists signed um, overseas, sometimes their label and publisher will have a UK licensee and sometimes they won't. Right. And like a sort of publisher or... Well, it's, for example, I mean, if, for example, an artist is signed in the States to a small independent record label, yeah, that record label may be partnered, They well, they may have their own UK office, Yeah, they may be partnered with a UK licensee, or you may have to deal directly with that label in America. Yeah, I think you mentioned um, in your book, you mentioned that um, the, the uh, example of Taylor Swift, who's got, who is assigned to the record label Big Machine, which is an indie, but yes. they also have a, a big deal with uh, Universal, with Universal, which obviously is a, yes. is a major I mean, Taylor record. Swift's obviously a completely different uh, category of artist, but yes. um, quite often with kind of small independent artists, it, it takes a bit of research to establish exactly wow. uh, whether or not you can do a deal directly with their label in another territory. I thought that's a bit mind blowing. I mean, would, wouldn't that be the task of a manager of Courtney Barnett to know these things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, but uh, again, you know, sometimes it's not always immediately apparent who the manager is, or if so, how you know how you can track them down. Right. It, it, it depends. Sometimes you can just simply Google the artist's name, manager, find the website, all the contact details, get them on the phone. But quite often, it's not that straightforward, and. There's quite a lot of cross-referencing needs to be done against Wikipedia, against the artist's Facebook page, uh, to establish precisely who represents them, and then, you know, whether or not you can get hold of their contact details. It, it, de it depends. So how did this come about in the, in the case of Hunter and uh, Connie Barnett? You got a call from Hunter and said, oh, um, we're really excited yeah, about so artists, we would want to use Hunter, our music. Hunter um, selected the tracks. I think they right. worked with a separate creative music supervisor who made the creative <laughs> suggestion, and then Very they... Good. Um, and they advised us which tracks they wanted to use, and then we started looking into them. Uh, from memory on that project, there were one or two that were signed to majors that the, the quotes we received back were far in excess of the budget that was available. So those tracks were set aside as mm -hmm. being too expensive. Mm -hmm. Courtney Barnett, memory ended up being more than they wanted to pay, but it worked within within the, the available well, budget. Well, definitely, because, I mean, Hunter is the sort of boots that you would wear good to go to festivals like Glastonbury and uh, Reading, etc. And Courtney Barnett is definitely the kind of artist that you would find on this festival circuit. So I think that the link between Courtney Barnett, what she represents, what she embodies also as a, as a young uh, female artist, brand hunter, uh, there are lots of sy synergies. So I think it would it was a lovely project. And so in, you said it was a straightforward uh, sync deal. Was that through a master license as well as a sync license, both for the publishing and the... Yes. Uh, yeah, obviously, because you, you use the sound recording, yeah, obviously. Yeah, by straight sync deal, I mean, it, it, there was no involvement of the artist in terms of live performance. So that's when I say straight sync deal, uh, I mean, I get it. it's simply licensing the song and the recording. Right. And again, it's interesting the point you just made, because, again, the, the way I use the word sync is I will I think about a sync right in the song and a sync right in the recording. In the US, interestingly, they often talk about sync and master, meaning in their terminology, sync purely refers, relate, 
related to the song, the publishing, right? Yeah. And the master license is then in respect of the recording. However, when that master license comes through, it may well say synchronization license on the top okay. of the document. And it's usually issued by the sync team of the record label. So I, I tend to think of sync as being an all encompassing term. Yeah. Within which is publishing for the song and master for the recording. Understood. But that's that's just my take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then it's just a matter of reading what the content of a master sync license is, and yes. then you can see whether it relates to the song or to a sound recording. Yeah. Well, a master sync license is only going to relate to the. Recording. Oh, sorry, so the sync license. Yeah. 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 So how did Hanser use that? piece of music on which they had all the licensed all the rights did they use it for the, the catwalk show or did they put it in and that um no it was it was licensed for the show for the show yeah okay so basically fashion brands whenever they do their catwalk show, shows they have to clear all the rights for all the songs which are going to be played on the catwalk it, well it's an, the... it's an interesting question um before shows were made available as live streams or video on demand all they needed were public performance licenses for the venue so in the UK, those would be PRS and PPL licenses. Right. If the repertoire that they were playing were by songwriters that were PRS members or PRS affiliates, and if the recordings were record labels that were PPL members or affiliates. Of course, over the last at least five years, a lot of fashion brands now live stream their events or make them available on demand. So Which that, is that requires sync licenses. So right. those songs and recordings have to be pre-cleared title by title with negotiated fee uh, in order that they can be used within the show that's made available to the public effectively outside of the room yeah um, and, and that's that's been an interesting and yeah stuff. and that's been an interesting change in the last few years sure. well it's good more money for you and hopefully more money for lawyers as well <laughs> well it, it did, and, and more money for for the rights owners but then it, it depends on right. the so, stature yeah. of the track yeah. and the brand and the usage rights of the thank you for giving us giving us uh, so much information about this particular example and uh, well done for doing something with Courtney Barnett because I really think she's got a bright future ahead of her. Yeah, I wanted to come back on your background. Yesterday I browsed on your LinkedIn profile. I hope you don't mind. (laughs) And I saw that you started as a clarinetist at Guildhall, right? Uh, It's fantastic. So I did a music degree at City University a long time ago. Okay. And within that degree uh, was the opportunity to study a lead instrument at Guildhall so my classical instrument not that I play it anymore was clarinet and and I did all my grades rather than the piano I wish actually I'd done it on the piano instead but I didn't and so for two years I had clarinet lessons with a a great teacher called Anton Weinberg well great you emulated um, both Woody Allen and my brother Uh, (laughs) my brother has has played clarinet for 12 13 years in the uh, I wasn't a great I wasn't a great clarinetist okay he was not not well I did concertist or no I I knew I was never good enough to do it as a solo and to be honest I didn't want to I did after university play clarinet in called Miro for quite a few years and we made a few albums and we did several tours in Italy and it was great fun yeah. um, I never made any money doing it but I had a great great laugh um, so you basically moved from the creative side which probably when you were a kid was a sort of hobby you know a sort of mm-hmm. extracurricular activity and then you graduated in that and then you moved away from the purely creative side to more music business focused approach and I think that then you moved on to music composition and also working for a music production company and even setting up a music production yeah. company. So and... I set up a music production company to write music for ads and TV for a couple of years Right. which gave me the first sort of exposure to ad agencies so I spent what was it called this one it's called Nim Nim right yeah Nim mm-hmm. Nim Music yeah so within that I was both you know writing but also together with my business partner at the time knocking on a lot of doors in Soho trying to get in you know in the front or a lot of ad agencies who were very difficult to get to see right um I remember on many many occasions we'd arrange meetings turn up to see people they weren't there yeah that was very common well um, hey I, I know it was a long yeah. time ago but that's a perfect yeah. way to you know prepare the background oh, uh, and yeah. to build and forge those relationships yeah. quite early in the days yes and then and you can reap on this this, this relationship but it takes a lot yeah. of time well, it, always it was an interesting learning experience in terms of how ad agencies dealt with composers and music production companies um and certainly just kind of understanding at the time who the main ad agencies in london were what the structure was in terms of the teams within them so at a very basic level account management tv production and creative well understanding how they were structured yeah, inside. yeah exactly exactly ah. um so which were the big players at the time in the ad business well 
the ones. Saatchi and Saatchi. Yeah, I mean, the, the big network agencies that are still around now. So, Saatchi and Saatchi, McCann Erickson, Ogilvy and Mather, JWT, Gray. I mean, you know, yeah, all, no the big, <laughs> all the big networks. Um, and, you know, and there were some of the independents that have since come and gone. It was my kind of first exploration into the way ad agencies worked. And, and, and it was through doing that that I managed to get into. Zomba and, and the, the world of music publishing. I was about to say, and then you mm. kind of put yourself outside this music production company business and uh, music composition business, and you delved into publishing for yes. quite a few years. And yes. I was reading on your LinkedIn profile that Zomba apparently was one of the biggest, largest independent it, well, it uh, publishers. It, it was the, the largest independent. Before it uh, got acquired um, by BMG. Exactly. Yeah, which now is the la- largest, like the mini major, as they yes. call it. Well, and, and the fact that I just read a, an interesting interview with um, the head of the UK business who what, of, BMG? of BMG and she describes BMG as being kind of neither an independent nor a major but a sort of a third She's got the, the point. third way and yeah. yeah I would I would agree um, so what did this teach you how did what did you learn when you were at Zumba in this publishing capacity um, oh you were head of TV film and media by the way so you were still doing syncs absolutely yeah, yeah. so um, a bit like Tom Foster is doing at um, UMPG uh, exactly, University yes, of Music yeah, Publishing I mean, yeah Tom, Tom's in charge of a far bigger department. I, when well, I start, when I started, I was the whole film TV department. <laughs> there was no one else. Um, That's when, nice feeling. When, huh? when I arrived, sync wasn't anything like as established then as it yeah. is now. Mm-hmm. It was seen as what? Oh, what years are we talking about? Uh, Sorry, I joined Zomba in March '94. Right here, so the '90s. Yeah, okay. so mid '90s. Zomba's label Jive had had a huge amount of success with a lot of US rap artists, and then moving into R and B. So. A few years before, they'd had a massive hit in the UK with Boom Shake the Room by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. They started having a lot of success with R. Kelly. In the UK on Silvertone, they'd had a huge hit with the Stone Roses, although then a very uh, acrimonious lawsuit uh, okay. with them as well. Um, That's not a rap band. No, the Stone, yeah. Stone Roses yeah. was sort of British sort yeah. of indie act from the sort of mad Chester scene, as it was called. They also had a huge amount of success in publishing with... Uh, a very famous rock writer producer called um, Matt Langer. They published Iron Maiden and Def Leppard, and in the UK, Bruce Springsteen as well. Yeah, we're definitely a big um, indie publisher. For so, sure. in terms of the learnings, I mean, it was an incredibly commercially driven organisation. It was all about the bottom line. They didn't care about chart positions or market share, wow, um, or awards or any of that. It was just about profit. Okay. Um, so it was quite a tough environment in which to to grow up in, but I learned a huge amount. And to be honest, I didn't really know a great deal about publishing when I started, mm-hmm. but I had to learn very fast. I remember when what, I... Wait, did you have some targets that you had to meet and um, stuff, like a salesperson? Not really, because they didn't really know. I mean, as time went on, yes, I kind of set my own targets. But when I started, I can remember within the first week, kind of, you know, well, I think in fact on the first day, yeah. being shown my office, and in, in these days, you know, everyone had their own office. And, How nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the great thing about that time, and it's so just, dis- you know, you, you'd arrive, first thing happened on the first day, you get your company car. Ah. Uh, Everyone had a company car. A company car company or a company car. card? Car, vehicle. Well, it was all about the bottom line, but they were not too called about the, yeah, the cost everyone as well. Everyone got cars um, and their own office. And Swanky. Huge fire, you know, that's what happened then. But I remember, you know, talking to my boss and going, right then, okay, well, what do you want me to do? And he, he opened up this huge cupboard with masses and masses of records, and we're talking vinyl. Uh-huh. Um, and <laughs> then said, there's the catalogue, figure out what's in there and go and sell it. And that was it. So Lovely. the initial... I would, I, that's, that's, yeah. kind of, that's a brief. Yeah, I mean, the initial that's a brief few for you. weeks and months were spent just actually figuring out what they had. Okay. No one had it other than the copyright database. So are you saying that they didn't have any database on the oh, computer? Oh, they, they, yeah, they had a copyright. The copyright department had a database of all the titles. Okay. But no one had kind of catalogued it in such a way that was useful for sync. So you so had to physically had to go for all the vinyls. Figuring out, right, what have we got in rock? What have we got in rap? What have we got in pop? And then Honestly. start looking at who are the artists that might actually be suitable for sync well you were really and good over time scratch. i had to kind of figure that out and and i did have quite a lot of contact with the my colleagues in the states who were already far far more advanced on this than i was so there was a, right. there was a big office in la who were very sync focused so after a few years i went across to see them um there were people in new york who did licensing so any 
licensing that I did of US repertoire, I had to talk to the people in, in New York, and likewise they had to talk to me for UK repertoire. So gradually I, I got a better understanding of kind of how it worked. I, I learned a huge amount from the in-house lawyers, both of whom are still around. So there's Mark... What, for, a BMG? Uh, no, uh, uh, Zomba. A Zomba so, still so, exists? Well, no, Zomba doesn't exist anymore, but at the time. So the, the lawyer who was there initially, head lawyer, is a guy called Mark Furman, who okay. is now, as far as I know, a Parlophone. Okay. And subsequently, Michael Smith, who's now, you know, the most senior legal person at Sony Music. Okay. Both of these. So they've moved around. They stay in the business. Um, uh, Michael went from but to BMG to Sony, BMG to Sony. Well, um, in a way, you were really lucky that you mm. had the Los Angeles office knowledge you could leverage. Yes. In order to uh, basically not to have to reinvent the wheel, was that Los Angeles office mainly working for uh, on, on syncs for feature films, or was it also doing some business on the ad business? Um, on the ad the side? LA office was almost entirely working on film and TV. TV as well. Um, dealing with the Hollywood studios. Right. Where there was opportunity to play songs into ads that tended to be dealt with by New York, initially just on a reactive basis. Right. But subsequently they hired someone to deal with it on a proactive basis. Mm -hmm. um, so the ad was done out of New York. Yeah. I, I mean, it's still... Feature films and TV was done out of LA. Los Angeles and, yeah. and you were doing what you could and both sides out of London for, to cater for the needs of a European market. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't changed that much, really. No. In, Amer in America, generally, my understand understanding is still if you want to work in the ad business, it's mostly New York or exactly. Chicago. Okay. Because um, Leo Burnett is headquartered in Chicago. Ah. Um, there are some agencies in, in L.A., Whereas the film and TV industry is yeah. obviously very much centred in LA. That's right. I'm, I'm currently working with a music composer who's based out of London, and he wants to f move away from, I already mentioned him mm -hmm. to you, move away from music production for ads and more into feature films. Yeah. And he's a mercenary, you know. If a job is offered to him uh, for, uh, to go to LA, he'll go. Yeah, well, take his have, that, bags you, and his you, wife, and you, he'll just go. And, yeah. and frankly, yeah, I mm. think it's a great attitude because if you really want to, I mean, you have to be serious about what Absolutely. your priorities are. And uh, feature films is still very much oh, LA uh, focused. And um, having just come back from New York and going back there again, there is a great benef benefit of being physically present. Yeah, um, people sure. need to see you. You know, you need to be seen. New agent, yeah. I mean, need, I'm talking about him. Yeah, but you need, you know, you need to be physically there. It's, you know, yeah. if you're true. out of sight, you're out of mind. So, you mm. know, they need to know that you are there in their time zone, available to them. Because Los Angeles is wonderful, so why not? Mm -hmm. So after the great experience, very formative years at Zumba, the publisher, you um, decided to create that joint venture with BBH, which is one of the main contenders in the ad business, I understand, um, the likes of McCann, Ericsson, and um, uh, uh, WPP. So BBH and you, you set up that joint venture, which is Lip Music, which is, um, as you describe on your LinkedIn profile, the first music publishing company um, inside a UK ad agency and created, I quote, significant waves in publishing community at the time. What do you mean by that? Historically in the UK... Thank you. No, no, no. Well, I'll, I'll kind of explain how it came about. So at Zomba, we had quite a number of um, publishing admin deals with broadcasters and TV production companies. So, for example, Channel 4. And prior to the consolidation of all of the ITV franchises, there were separate companies in each region. Um, these days, it's all just ITV. But going back to the 90s, there were probably... a dozen or so different companies, um, and Zomba had admin deals with um, HTV in Wales, Border TV up in the northwest, and Channel TV in the Channel Islands. What do you mean, um, sorry, what do you mean by admin deals? Okay, so admin deals meant that where these companies were commissioning bespoke music, typically for news themes or promos, um, or sometimes for kind of editorial programming, we would provide those companies with the contracts in order that they could acquire the copyright in those uh -huh. bespoke scores, and Zomba would then administer them. So an assignment of 100% of the copyright in the song. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. So maybe we got a publisher per yeah, se. Yeah, so they became the original publisher, but you know they weren't in the publishing business, so yeah. they didn't know how to do registrations and royalty collection. Right. And that's what Zomba would do. Ah, as, um, a, as an administrator. As an administrator. Okay. The composer would still get the 50% share of PRS yeah. royalties directly Yeah. Um, and 50% share of any ancillary mechanical or sync income. Uh -huh. um, but we would... Uh, collect 50% of the performance income, the publisher share, take a commission and pass it back to the client. Um, a bit like a sub-publisher in a foreign yes, country. Exa yeah? exa exactly. And I wondered why was no one doing this in advertising? 
you know, I knew in, house. in, in well, in the UK. And I knew, I, okay. I had a sense that in America, this was already happening, but in the UK, it wasn't. Hmm. Um, and this thought was sparked by meeting someone who, um, at the time was working for P and G and told me about how the system works in, um, in the U S and we were debated why wasn't anyone doing it here. So because I'd been meeting quite a lot of heads of TV uh, or heads of TV production of various ad agencies, I started kind of floating this idea and I had a very positive reception from a few, particularly Francis Royal, who was the head of production at BBH and BBH had quite a long history of involvement in music, particularly in relation to the Levi's brand. So they'd had, there were a lot of hit records that had come off the back of Levi's ads I in remember the uh, there's ads from Levi's in, yeah. the, in the, the, the mid noughties and the beginning of an uh, yeah, yeah well, they in were the cool. this is, in this the nineties yeah, the 90s, yeah. 90s, they were cool 90s, I remember and, yeah and so every on music TV. company was knocking on their deal wanting yeah. to do business with them so, uh, uh, over a two year period I kind of worked out um, how to kind of put together a, a, a joint venture kind of music publishing company with BBH um, which we then launched in April 2003. So the idea was to ensure that BBH would get 100% of the copyright on the song in the projects that, what the TV projects they were involved in, the ad project they were involved in, and then you, uh, for your John Venture and uh, 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 Lip Music, you would basically do the administration of this? Um, slightly, uh, different, slightly different to that. So ah. for projects where the creative need was a bespoke score, as opposed to an existing license track, for those projects, BBH would commission the composer, normally within which there would be a limited sync license, but then separate to that the composer would assign the copyright in the composition to leap so leap became the publisher okay initially we had a global administration deal with a sub publisher and then after a period of time we took the uk out of that and self-administered for the uk you did interesting yeah. which as it turned out became more of a headache than was worthwhile but it's I, a lot of time to yeah, allocate a collection of rights yeah yeah and were you doing this? Were you doing this? Sorry, only for BBH, or do you have some other clients? Um, the direct acquisition of copyright was almost entirely for BBH. We did subsequently do an admin deal with Vodafone, okay, where where they became the publisher of the scores that they commissioned, and we administered Leap administered those, mm. and then we also did a huge amount of sync deals, again mostly on behalf of. Uh, BBH, but we did do it a little bit with a few other agencies as well. That's, that's interesting what you are mentioning about Vodafone because that was one of my follow-up questions. When I went to the Sync Summit in London last year, you were there actually as a speaker, I remember. You kind of oh, invited yeah. me actually. <laughs> um, Organised by Mike Fraser. There oh, was Sync, Sync Summit. Uh, Sync Summit in London in April 2015. Oh, that one. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, that was one. Think, I was thinking of the London Sync Sessions. Yes, no, no, you're right. Yeah. You're right. And yeah. Um, um, on the day where you're not there, uh, 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 there, there, there were there was um, one of the speakers was um, the Sync EP for Coca-Cola. And right. Tom Froster from uh, uh, Universal Publishing mentioned that um, he didn't really like the approach of uh, Coca-Cola because they insist on having uh, an assignment of 100% of, of the rights on all the songs that they are going to use. That's basically not a temporary uh, license, that's a permanent assignment of, 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 of rights. So obviously the publisher is, uh, is cut out and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the brand becomes the new publisher of mm -hmm. the, uh, or becomes the sole publisher yeah, of this. Uh, is, is that not the case though with newly commissioned songs? Yeah. So I think it, my understanding of the way they work is that they might approach an artist slash songwriter as opposed to a jobbing composer. Mm -hmm. And and in their capacity of songwriter, as songwriter, they might typically have an exclusive publishing deal. Yeah. But then the brand insists that if that songwriter is going to get the gig to write for Coca Cola, they have to persuade their publisher to give up the publishing in that song and give it to Coke instead. So, yeah. Um, so that the, 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 then the, the um, songwriter has to get a waiver from exactly. the publisher, yeah. and the same if some yeah. recording is going to be used, also a waiver yeah. from his, his or her label. Uh, yes, that, that's yeah. right. But my point was, so Coca Cola is not the only big brand doing this. Apparently, Vodafone as well insists on uh, an assignment of one hundred percent of the rights. And do you know some other? Um, well, the CAC 40 when we were working, or FTSE 500 uh, companies, who, or you know, who who are uh, Dow Jones, like the biggest yeah. uh, large cap in the world, uh, which are requiring that 
they get an assignment of 100% of the rights? I think you've got to distinguish between whether you're dealing with bespoke instrumental scores by composers who, for whom many are used to that assignment model, um, as opposed to the creation of new songs by songwriters who are known to the public as artists yeah. who already have exclusive publishing agreements. And they're two very different situations. So when we were working with Vodafone, the original scores that they acquired, that we helped them acquire, were um, original scores by composers writing music to order for an audiovisual brief. Now that's quite different from commissioning artist mm -hmm. to write a song where that artist is known first and foremost as being a songwriter, yeah. um, where they already have an exclusive publishing deal. Um, so I think they're two different situations. Okay. Um, in America, it's quite common, mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the case of bespoke scores, it's been common for many, many years, mm -hmm. um, because in America there is the concept of work for hire, mm -hmm. which doesn't really exist in the UK in the same way, um, not quite in the same way, or it's certainly not accepted in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, also within the UK, there's a very long-standing way of working between music production companies and advertising agencies, whereby music production companies represented by a trade body called PCAM have a standard template with IPA member advertising agencies that provides for the supplier, so the music production company, retaining the copyright in the composition that's been assigned to them by the composer and licensing it to the ad agency. And to go back to your question about why Leap created a lot of waves at the time it was set up, ECAM were very a very vocal opponent of what Leap was doing. Right. Because they felt threatened by it. Um, because you were requiring be, for 100% of the assignment. Because we we were saying that we, Leap, as um, a subsidiary of the agency, will acquire the copyright and that bespoke score, rather than the supplier retaining the copyright. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, a number of the larger kind of pop, rock, music publishers were very upset about the thought of Advertising, advertising agencies getting into the music publishing business. Mm -hmm. So at the time, there was a lot of very vocal opposition to it. And a lot of people, I can remember a lot of people saying to me, you won't last six months. Um, and How long did you last? I was there for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Richard. Well done. And so more recently, you launched um, Resilient uh, Music, but we've yeah. already explained what, mm -hmm. what you're doing about context. So... Um, How's your book do, doing? Have you sold a lot of copies? Um, you happy with? I've sold a few hundred. I, have I sold? I've probably sold a few hundred. But the the purpose of the book ultimately was not as a retail project. You know, it's a very niche title. It was never going to be something that was going to be on the shelves of W. A. Smith. I, I, um, I think it's a good reference. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, opus. If if one is interested yes. in this uh, music procurement business and how to go about it, of course, it's um, I'd say for people who are beginners. Uh, but it's a very good introduction to uh, the ins and outs of sure. this type of business. I mean, where, where it's been useful, it's it's been great as a sort of conversation starter with yeah. prospects that I visit. So, you know, having just done this trip to New York, every single meeting um, I had, I would begin the meeting by pulling out a copy of the book and putting it on the table. That's great. Um, <laughs> and that's quite an effective strategy to begin a meeting because, and as a result of doing that, I mean, I've just been invited back to go and speak to or present to the ANA, which is the Association of National Advertisers. It's the US equivalent of ISBAR, which is the trade body for brands. So I'm, I'm presenting to their members on 2nd of November in, in New York. Yeah. I've also used it in a, an educational context. In I saw it. Yeah, so I've, I've been invited to speak lectured to... Lectured at Cambridge. Uh, yeah, so quite a few universities. Um, it's perfect for students because that's open well, level. I hope so. I hope, I hope so. Yeah. Um, and quite a number of colleges that um, have music business management courses. Mm -hmm. So um, ACM, where my son attends, Kinghamshire, Hertfordshire, um, UEL. I've recently been approached by um, Bath University of Bath to speak to the marketing students. So that's been that's been quite interesting, and then I also use it in running training sessions for brands and agencies. Yeah, I think that's maybe more yeah. where the more commercial uh, use of your book yes. comes. It's it's very um, encouraging what I'm hearing from you that this book is of, obviously it wasn't a retail project, but it's a great business development yeah, tool absolutely. because we um, at uh, the International Association of in, in, uh, uh, Lawyers of the Creative Industries, YLC, that um, I preside and I founded mm. back in 2013, we are writing a book on fashion and uh, luxury brands in the digital 
portfolio and my god it's so time consuming and also <laughs> it creates a lot of conflicts between you know a lot of pointing the fingers between who's done that and who has not done that yet etc etc so it's quite a tough process to write a book as we can now yeah. uh, assess all firsthand and so it's good to hear that when you've put so much you know blood and sweat and, mm -hmm. and effort and energy into this it's it, you can reap the benefits afterwards when it's published and you can use it as a very efficient business development tool so thanks for that yeah I would hope. say <laughs> the, the things that made it what helped me do it is I I met a great uh, coach called um, Lucy McCarraher okay and I attended one of her courses and she has quite a sort of strict discipline system that business to business authors should work to the guidance was that a typical business book should be around about 30,000 words Okay. And that if you are truly disciplined, you will write it, write the first draft in a month by committing to um, getting up, you know, an hour or two earlier every day and writing a thousand or fifteen hundred words every day. And that's the only way you get it done. Blimey. If you take if you try and fit it around the rest of your schedule, y you'll never get it done. So yeah, well, I, that's I, what I'm going to say yeah. to my fellow colleagues at Yalsi. I'm sure we're going to love yeah. it. Yeah, so the book. <laughs> Just wake up at five in the morning yeah. to write your 2,000 words a day. The first, the first draft was written in a month. The time-consuming bit is all the editing because um, it goes through several, several stages of being proofread by, by what are called B-readers, um, and you pick your B-readers from different disciplines. So I had um, members of my own team read it from a kind of legal and paralegal perspective. I had market, To get some constructive yeah, feedback. I had market procurement um, people read it, marketers read it, a bunch of different people, and then you take all their feedback and you figure out, in a lot of cases, there's lots of corrections to do. In some cases, there's lots of stuff that you delete. In other cases, there's there's issues that you need to elaborate on. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of advice about... I mean, the, the advice was very frank and, in some cases, quite brutal, but very good. You know, so I would give people hard copies and they would, you know, um, scribble on it. And mm -hmm. there'd be lots of comments, you know, boring, tedious, repetition, fix this. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. But that's good. No biggie, that's good. No biggie go allowed. Yeah. But hey, that's how you grow. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then you have to go, great, okay, good, fine. So I thought this made sense, but clearly it doesn't. I've got to figure out how to explain it in a more simple way. Hmm. I can remember other people saying, oh, you're giving too much away here. Uh -huh. uh, and there were sections where I had previously kind of spelt things out step by step. And in the final cop edition, it's been replaced by this stuff's very complex. If you want to learn more about this, you need to hire an expert consultant or <laughs> words to that effect. <laughs> come, yeah, come to me. <laughs> um, and here's my phone number. Well, not quite. But, um, no, in any case, well done. Well done. It's entertaining. And... To the point, and I really like the well, anecdotes. I, I hope so. I mean, it is. it's a very, quite an opaque area, and I've tried yeah. to explain it in such a way that hopefully people understand it. It's, it's complex. I mean, out of all the creative industries that I advise, I've got clients in the luxury fashion sector, but also design, um, art, mm -hmm. um, music, films. I must say music law is uh, probably the most complex I, ha I, I, uh, I have accounted and I love it because it's mm -hmm. so complex and um, sophistic so sophisticated. I think the reason being that there are so many channels of revenues that you know cover um, money that you collect for collecting societies, uh, money that you collect as one of payments through the sync deals, yeah. etc. So yeah. it's complex and it's fascinating yeah. well, but it's, um, it's, it's not easy access. It's not always just legal. I mean a lot of it is just about ways of working and knowing True. how things are done yeah. and also kind of understanding you know the way that certain rights owners behave because they don't all behave in the same way. I am Annabelle Gaberti and this is Lawfully Creative from Crefervi Studios.